Hi all, my name's Nate. I'm filling in for John this week, as this week we're going to be talking about human memory, which happens to be the area of research that I am most interested in as a um, fourth year graduate student in the department, um, close friend of John's, and I'm very excited to be um, given the opportunity to lead this lecture series for you guys. So this week, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about human memory. And we're going to begin with an overview of memory, which views memory as a series or a system of different types of memories. And the basic learning objective for the first part of these lectures is that by the end of this lecture, it's my hope that you'll be able to identify and describe the different theorized systems of memory and also be able to explain how the systems of memory view originated based on your anatomical findings, to be able to identify diseases that affect different systems of memory and relate the systems of memory to their underlying neural structures. So I anticipate that this first lecture should span two presentations, each about 10 minutes a piece. And so we'll begin with a very basic question, which is to ask, what is a memory? And most of you probably have some understanding or some idea of how you would explain to someone what a memory is. In some sense, it's pretty self-explanatory since, well, we all have memories. And most of your definitions would probably converge on something like, well, a memory is something to do with the mind, so it's a mental representation. And I'm pretty sure all of you would have to say, it would say something about how the memory pertains to a past event, so something that has already transpired. But is a memory really always a mental representation of a past event? And this idea of a mental representation implies that the memory is being held in the mind. Now, sometimes memories are not always so easily retrievable in the mind, or, and that some examples of this would be, for example, motor memory. So your body, your muscles have very basic memories of their own. Um, so you can think about if you work out, your muscles over time adapt to the, the types of routine movements that you're doing. But even just walking is a type of motor memory and your body is able to encode and remember how to do these types of things. So is this really a mental representation? Does that definition fit this type of memory? And also, sometimes memories do not pertain to past events. So sometimes the memories pertain to events that have yet to happen. And this is referred to as perspective memory or memory for future events. Essentially, this is remembering to do something, remembering that you have to do something in the future. So in that sense, this idea that a memory is a mental representation of a past event simply wouldn't encompass all different types of memory that there might be. And the prevailing consensus among um, psychologists although it has come under some debate, but the prevailing consensus is that memory is actually a collection of systems and that each system serves a distinct function. So a memory system is simply a structure that is anatomically and evolutionarily distinct from other memory structures. And simply what this means is that it's both physically and functionally dissociable, physically entailing that different neural structures underlie each of the different types of memories, which we'll review in a moment, and functionally meaning that each of the different types of memory serves a different purpose. So next, what are these systems of memory? Well, there's at least five under traditional theories, and below I list these in order of increasing evolutionary complexity. So first we have procedural memories. Now procedural memories are really basic memories for how to do things, motor learning or simple skills such as walking, for example. So how learning how to walk requires some type of memory, but it's not necessarily as complex as, say, remembering what you did last weekend. But this is nevertheless a type of memory. Next, we can talk about perceptual representation system. Now, this type of memory system receives much less research, and we won't discuss it as much as the other types that, are, um, that I'm going to talk about on this slide. But essentially what this is, is your brain processing um, sensory information as you're registering objects. So as, as you're perceiving objects in your environment, your brain is attending to the visual and the acoustic information. So there are some aspects of what's referred to as sensory memory. Sensory memory is a very, very, very short-term storage of information from one of the senses. You can think of this as auditory information that's passing through the ears or visual information that's passing through the eyes. So we won't really go as much 
into depth about the perceptual representation system. We will talk a little bit more about the next few systems. So semantic memory, this is simply responsible for general knowledge, facts, concepts, and vocabulary. And the thing about semantic memory is you don't really need to remember the specific learning episode in which you learned the information. So for example, you know that the sky is blue, but you don't have to remember that you were told that the sky is blue in order to know that the sky is blue. And working memory, also sometimes referred to as short-term memory, is the temporary maintenance and storage of information in mind. Now it is severely limited in its capacity and we'll spend a few lectures discussing um, working memory in a bit more depth, so I won't go into too much detail about it here. The last system of memory, and the one that you probably think of the most when you think about what a memory is, is episodic memory. And this is memory that supports the remembering of personally experienced events, sometimes referred to as episodes, so things that are autobiographical in detail. And so we can take these five systems of memory and we can dichotomize them into two classifications. And those are non-declarative versus declarative. Sometimes you'll see the word non-declarative as being more um, implicit and declarative as being explicit. So you can put these into words, but you can't put those into words. And so, as I just said, for non-declarative memories, you can't really explain the memory, the event, the whatever it is that you have learned, you can't really explain it so much in words. Whereas for a declarative memory, you can certainly explain this verbally. You can pass knowledge about this event on to someone else um, verbally. And this would be memory for a fact or a specific event, whereas a non-declarative memory would be memory for a procedure. So examples of non-declarative memories, these are things like how to drive a car, how to walk. Although, of course, with how to drive a car, when you're helping or you're teaching someone how to drive a car, you can kind of explain some of the, the instructions to the person and ideally you would want to because no one's going to just get in a car right away and know immediately how to drive. However, a lot of the actual process of learning how to drive a car is um, self-initiated, meaning you have to be doing it. You can't just learn, you can't just have someone say, give you the instructions of how to do it. Like you have to actually go through the steps yourself. Now, Another example would be how to walk. Imagine trying to tell someone how to walk. I think you would find it really hard to tell uh, someone who's never walked before, well, you put this leg in front of this leg and then this leg in front of that leg. This makes absolutely no sense. These types of memories are only learned through experience and over time. And that's again, in contrast to declarative memories, which include things like, what did you do last Saturday? So from a systems of Memory perspective, our non-declarative systems are our procedural memories, our motor memories, um, and the perceptual representation system. For a declarative memory, these are the more advanced systems of memory, semantic memories, working memory, and episodic memory. And so next time, we'll discuss where evidence underlying the systems of memory view actually originates from. So until next time.